Gracious God and Father, we thank you for the rain and the snow, which are an answer to our prayers. We pray that you would give us lots more in the months ahead. Uh, tonight, we pray that you would nourish and feed us with your word. In the book of Isaiah, your word says, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without water, first watering the earth, making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word, declares the Lord. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And so tonight, we pray that you would achieve the purpose of your word that we would be drawn to both repentance from our sin and joyful faith in our great Redeemer, our true judge, our true leader, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So thanks for being here tonight. Um, this is going to be a, a, um, a dark chapter. Yes, it is. And many of the chapters in Judges are dark, but this one especially so. Yeah. Um, let me find my meeting control, make sure nobody's trying to come in. Okay. Um, and, and so if you're uh, live with us right now, and then certainly if you're watching this uh, on YouTube or some other location where you have access to the video, before we get started, uh, one of the commentators I, I read had, had a couple of thoughts, uh, and one in particular that I wanted to share. And that is, if you have been the victim of a sexual assault, this may be a very difficult chapter for you. And um, it may be hard for you to watch this video. And it's okay if you decide, you know, maybe I'll just read the chapter and I, I don't want to be certainly public now or, or when you're watching the video. Because what we're going to read about tonight is a brutal sexual assault uh, that ends with death. And it's a very, very dark time. Uh, yeah in Israel and, and maybe for you as well. So just, I wanna, I don't wanna put that out there before we, uh, before we go any farther tonight, okay? So we are in uh, the book of Judges and uh, before we get into chapter 19 tonight, I wanna ask if anyone had an opportunity uh, to, to talk with someone or um, perhaps communicate via electronic means to share the hope of Christ with anybody or begin a conversation because that's a sometimes that's a journey of a hundred steps. Sounds like we've all been isolated for a week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that happens, doesn't it? That's one of the challenges that coronavirus and economic shutdowns present us with is that we are often very isolated. And that's a problem because people being isolated need Jesus more, and yet they're isolated. So let me, let me put it uh, as, a, as a challenge to you guys uh, tonight that before we meet next Wednesday, or if you're watching this video in the next seven days, make an intentional effort to communicate to someone the hope you have in Jesus. And it's really easy for us to do electronically, isn't it? So you might send an email or a text to someone you know that maybe is uh, in need of encouragement. It could be a, we have some members of our church right now who are dealing with the coronavirus. So a phone call to them or, or an email or something like that might be helpful. Or if you have a neighbor, uh, maybe with all this wind, at least that we're having here in Northern California, maybe a knock on the door tomorrow and say, is everything okay at your house? I just... I uh, was thinking about how bad it was yesterday, and I was praying and thinking, you know, I want to make sure that you don't have any leaks or um, don't have any uh, trees that fell down or branches in your yard, uh, something like that. Uh, so let's all, you know, make an effort in the next seven days to do something like that, all right? Okay, as we get into Judges 19 tonight, uh, we're going to be getting into the the second part of the epilogue. And so you'll recall that chapters 17 and 18 were the first epilogue, if you will, and chapters 19 to 21 are the second epilogue. Or if you take all five of those chapters as one big epilogue, then it's part one and we're starting part two tonight. And so the first two chapters um, dealt with the Levites who had some gods that he had made for him. And the tribe of Dan moves in. They're, they're kind of violent and 
and we see that going on. And and so, um, it's it's that's a dark story because the the Danite soldiers come upon an unsuspecting people and they they slaughter everybody. This is the people of God, <laughs> right? So you think that's bad? It gets even worse tonight. Uh, and by the end of the book of Judges, uh, I think we'll be crying out for gospel and and encouragement in Jesus Christ. And that's good. That's that's where we should be. Yes. Okay, so we'll start uh, tonight with a little bit of introduction. Uh, we get the refrain at 19, verse 1, in those days Israel had no king. And I'll refer you to the previous Bible study in the previous video. Uh, I believe it was 17, 6, 18, 1, 19, 1, and 21, 25 that have this refrain. Okay, we got... I'm going to admit someone else here. Yeah. There, there she is. Hi, Kareem. Good to see you. You're not hearing me yet, are you? Hello, Kareem. Can you hear me? Not yet. I know I'm not muted because other people are hearing me. Let's see if I can help you here. Hi, Corrine. I can see you. Hi. There we go. Good. All right. You're in. Great. Good. We're just getting started, so you haven't really missed much. Good. I will repeat, though, the one kind of sobering thing I said at the beginning is that chapter 19 details a very painful and brutal sexual assault. And so what I said at the beginning of the chapter was that, you know, it, it can be a painful thing to listen to if, if you know someone who has experienced this or uh, have been close to that yourself. So we're just trying to encourage people to be kind of ready for that and um, be aware that it's a, it's a painful story. So what we're looking at here, at, we're at chapter 19 of Judges, verse 1. We have this refrain, in those days, Israel had no king. It's at uh, chapter 17, and I, I said before, verse 6. I think that's correct. Uh, yes, it's in 18, verse 1, 19, verse 1, and then at the very end of Judges 21, 25. Mm -hmm. And so that's a reminder. We're getting, we're getting a new episode here. These two accounts, and what I'm talking about is chapter 17 and 18, and then the second account, chapters 19 to 21, reveal that the danger to Israel does not simply come from outside threats, but from within. Mm. And what we'll see tonight uh, is there are striking parallels between this account, chapters 19 and 20, especially not so much chapter 21, and the account of Sodom or Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. And, and it, it, the, there's so many similarities, there's no way it's an accident. And so whoever put together the book of Judges wanted to make sure that the readers slash hearers of the book of Judges, when they got to this part, said, wait a minute, I totally see the connection. Oh, my goodness, this is awful. And so that's what's going on there. Okay, so what we have in Judges 19 verses 1 to 10 is the journey of, and I said the Levite, we might start here by saying a Levite, to reclaim his concubine. Now, this is not the same um, Levite that we saw in chapter 17 and 18, but as we noted when we started chapter 17, uh, these two epilogues deal with the one tribe that has had no mention in the book of Judges, that's the tribe of Levi. And so we're going to see that while all the other tribes had problems, the tribe of Levi does as well. And so we're going to read first verses 1 to 4. Would somebody care to read those? Judges 19 verses 1 to 4? I can. Wayne, Wayne you got it? Go ahead. In those days when there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite was sojourning in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, who took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem and Judah. And his concubine was unfaithful to him, and she went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in, Judea, in Judah, and was there for some four months. Then her husband arose and went after her, to speak kindly to her and bring her back. He had with him his servant and a couple of donkeys, and she brought him into her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, 
he came with joy to meet him. And his father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay, and he remained with them with him three days. And so they ate and drank and spent the night there. All right. And on the fourth day. That's good. Oh, uh, Thanks, Wayne. Uh, so yeah, we're just gonna look at these verses. Uh, right. Just get started. So in the first epilogue, we saw a Levite with a bad moral compass. He's the guy who steals from his mom. Um, he finally confesses it because he's afraid she's gonna put a, a curse on him. Um, they get, she gives, or he gives the money back to her. She makes a, um, a, an idol, a molten image. He, he becomes a priest for this guy named Micah. So you look at him and you go, man, that's, that, that guy's all messed up. But in this epilogue, we'll see this Levite, and he's a monster. He's really bad. He's the kind of guy that you would see on some of the graphic TV shows that are on, on television nowadays. Um, so uh, the woman is described here as a concubine. And so I looked that up. It's a different Hebrew word. Um, literally, it says, uh, the Hebrew says, a wife, a concubine. And so that extra word concubine is added there. Uh, and so there, you could have just a regular wife, right? And that would be someone that you would marry. Well, this concubine is a wife. So she's got some legal protections there, but she's of secondary rank. So she's not a mistress, she's not a prostitute, but neither is she um, like wife number one. Uh, and, and so she's uh, secondary in that respect. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And, and so as we see this, um, it, 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 well, it just, gets, it just gets worse. But he treats her like a second class citizen, and then he treats her like not even a citizen at all. And so it's, it's really bad. Okay. Um, now, what we're going to see here is she is dehumanized throughout the story. And if you can remember way back to when we started Judges, we noted that one of the features of Judges is that it highlights how women are treated. And they're treated really, really badly. Now, there are some great strong women in the, in the book of Judges. We remember Deborah. Uh, we remember Jael. She was the kind of the hero of, the, of one of the stories where she kills the uh, the uh, enemy commander while he she, he sleeps in her tent. But but here we have a, a story of a woman. She's dehumanized throughout the story, and and I'll give you details of that as we go. Uh, verse two reveals that the relationship between the Levite and the concubine was clearly flawed. I know that's kind of a of a vague statement, but I did that on purpose because um, looking at the commentaries and the way the Hebrew is written here, um, at the beginning of verse two, for example, says she prostituted, she whored. But, but then there's an interesting Hebrew um, preposition that goes with it, and it literally would be translated something like concerning him or uh, upon him. So what does that mean? It's not the usual way of saying someone prostituted herself. And one commentator said it might even mean that she prostituted on, on his behalf. In other words, that he pimped her out. Now, when I, when I was going through my commentaries, I go, well, that's kind of far out. I don't know about that. But when you get to the end of the story and you see how, she, how he treats her, it's, it's possible. It's plausible. So we don't really know exactly what the situation was. And if she had prostituted herself out or had been unfaithful to him, why would she go to her father? Wouldn't she go to the other man? So, so there's a lot of ambiguity about what's going on here. And I don't have a, a real clear-cut answer for you, but I'm just saying the relationship is bad. Maybe she was unfaithful. Maybe that's all it means. But the clear other end of the spectrum, spectrum could be that, that he actually pimped her out. And, and so we don't know for sure. But it's, it's bad. I can say that much very clearly. Uh, and so she goes to stay with her father, and she's there for four months. That in itself says something, doesn't it? If he really cared about her, would he wait four days? Maybe, but not four months. And so clearly there's, there's something wrong here. Something's wrong. 
I, I, four months, because I thought it said three days. Okay, well, maybe four. I'm misreading it here. No, you're right. Three days, three, four months. Four months. What verse is it? Two. two. Verse two. Oh, yeah, after she Oh, there, okay. Um, I thought you, so he waited four months to go get her. Yeah, right. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah. I, I see what you're saying. Now. You're saying when they, when they got there, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, so after these four months, then we get to verse three, and that gives kind of the impression of a planned effort. Um, he's, he's waited all this time. Um, he takes a servant with him, two donkeys. Um, I'm guessing on the back license plate, it said his and hers, something like that, you know? <laughs> so some type of planned planned effort here. Now, what was the husband's intent? It sounds really good, doesn't it? It yeah. says that he went to persuade her to return. Um, I think Wayne, when you were reading this, it said something else. What did what did your translation say? Arose and went after her to, to speak you, kindly to, to her. To speak kindly, right? Back. To speak kindly to her. Uh, and again, the Hebrew there is said to speak. Again, here's that weird preposition concerning her heart or to speak to her. But let that sounds sweet, but let's look at Genesis 34, 2 and 3. Genesis 34, 2 and 3. This is another uh brutal story um in the Bible. Um and would somebody read that, please, if you don't mind reading a few names? Otherwise, I can do it. When Shechem, son of Hamor, the Hivite, the ruler of that area, saw her, he took her and raped her. His heart was drawn to Dinah, daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So there's that phrase at the end, he spoke concerning her heart. And so... When you think about that, it sounds really great, and maybe it is, but in the same way that Shechem raped Dinah, we're going to see here later on in chapter 19 that, that the Levite, this man, doesn't really seem to care for the woman. So, you know, it's there's a lot of ambiguities in this chapter, and that's hard for me because I like nice, clear answers, and I like studying original languages and getting everything really clear, um, but... Uh, what was the husband's intent? You know, based, not knowing exactly what the relationship was like before, and was she unfaithful, or did he pimp her out? You know, that would have a huge bearing on how you translate this verse. Okay, now that I've given you those ambiguities, let's go on through verses 5 to 10, and back in Judges 19. And again, if someone would like to read. I can do it. Okay, John, thanks. Let me make sure. On the fourth day, they got up early and he prepared to leave. But the woman's father said to his son-in-law, refresh yourselves something to eat, then you can go. So the two of them sat down to eat and drink together. Afterward, the woman's father said, please stay tonight and enjoy yourself. And when the man got up to go, his father-in-law persuaded him. So he stayed there that night. On the morning of the fifth day, when he rose to go, the woman's father said, refresh yourself, wait till afternoon. So the two of them ate together. Then when the man with his concubine and his servant got up to leave, his father-in-law, the woman's father said, now look, it's almost evening. Spend the night here. The day is nearly over. Stay and enjoy yourself. Early tomorrow morning, you can get up and be on your way home. But unwilling to stay another night, the man left and went toward Jebus, that is Jerusalem, with his two saddled donkeys and his concubine. All right. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Uh, th this story just gets more and more bizarre, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> so, it's like the father doesn't want the daughter to leave. Yes, and I, I think that's a huge clue as to the toxicity of the relationship between the man and his concubine wife. It's not healthy. Uh, and we're not given the specifics of why, but 
it's, it's a disaster. Now, there's other clues in the text. For example, the word heart is significant in this chapter. You see it in verse 3, 5, 6, 8, 9, and 22. And, and so um, when John was reading, uh, for example, some of these words, um, he said, stay the night. Let's see, re refresh yourself. He's literally saying things like, um, be good to your heart, or it will be good for your heart to stay. Um, the translation, enjoy themselves. That, that says their hearts were good, were made good. And, and again, this is not an accident. And so what is going on here? I really believe that the father-in-law sees this relationship. He's, his daughter's been there four months, and she's probably filled him in. And he says, this Levite's heart is sick. And, and I need to do everything I can to make it healthy for my daughter's sake. And I, again, I'm, I'm putting words in there, so just take it for the opinion that it is. It's not right there in the text. But the hints in the text are there. Oh, just stay one more. Just one more night. It'll be good for your heart. And, and uh, you know, you, you, if you've ever had your children dating um, and they're getting serious, you want, you want that significant other to be in your home to make sure it's all good and to see them interacting together and for, for that person to see how you interact so you can pass on, hopefully, godly values to them. And, and I think that's what's going on. Now, throughout this section, the woman is not mentioned until verse 9. But the interplay between the Levite and his father-in-law is highlighted over and over and over again. Did you notice it says the two of them ate and drank? Mm -hmm. And so... These guys are kind of sequestered. Again, I, I think the uh, I, I think the father-in-law is doing everything he can to try and and get through to the heart of the Levite. The ESV says extreme in the in the unabridged notes. Extreme hus hospitality may have been the father's attempt to make up with a man for the daughter's misbehavior. Yeah, but that and then that's assuming again it's the daughter who's the problem and she was unfaithful. And maybe she was. We just don't know. Yeah. But yeah, he's uh, clear, clearly trying to help the relationship. Yeah, Sue. So he's referred to as father-in-law, but she's a concubine, so, but they're not married. I'm confused. Well, well they are. And right at the beginning, I think right before you joined, we looked at that first verse in 19. There was a man who, uh, where is it? He took a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. And, and the, the Hebrew there is actually two words. It's, it's a wife, a concubine. Oh. A, and a, a, a normal wife is going to be just one word, a wife. And when it has wife, concubine, that means she's like a, a, a secondary rank, I think is what I put on your study guide. She's, right. she's a, the woman is a wife of secondary rank. Oh. And so she's not a mistress or a prostitute, but neither is she a number one wife. Okay, sorry. No, that's fine. It's a good question. Good to clarify that. Okay, so now we get to being in Gibeah, and this is verses 11 to 21, and I didn't really break it up into sections, which would have been really smart, so um, I guess we'll just read it all one shot. So anybody feel like reading uh, verses 11 through 21? Otherwise, I'll do it. I don't mind. Okay, John, go. <clears throat> when they were new, near Jebus, and the day was almost gone, the servant said to his master, come, let's stop at this city of the Jebusites and spend the night. His master replied, no, we won't go into any city whose people are not Israelites. We will go on to Gibeah. Gibeah. He added, he added, come, let's try to reach Gibeah or Ramah and spend the night in one of those places. So they went on, and the sun set as they neared Gibeah in Benjamin. There they stopped to spend the night. They went and sat in the city square, but no one took them in for the night. Then he, that evening, an old man from hill country of Ephraim, who was living in Gibeah, the inhabitants of the place were Benjamites, came in from his work in the fields. When he looked and saw the traveler in the city square, 
The old man asked, what are you where are you going? Where did you come from? He answered, we are on our way from Bethlehem to Judah to a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim where I live. I have been to Bethlehem and Judah and now I am going to the house of the Lord. No one has taken me in for the night. We have both straw and fodder for our donkeys and bread and wine for ourselves, your servants. Me, the woman and the young man with us. We don't need anything. You are welcome at my house, the old man said. Let me supply whatever you need. Only don't spend the night in the square. So he took him into his house and fed his donkeys. After they had washed their feet, they had something to eat and drink. All right, thank you. So uh, quite a bit there to, to go through. In verse 12, the Levite described Jebus as a city of foreigners. And this will, this will be so ironic. And I, I probably should have said something um, earlier on when we were looking at, uh, at verse, what verse was it? 10? Um, when they drew near Jebus, uh, that is Jerusalem. And so, yeah, it's verse 10 there. So it, that, that, little, that little parenthetic comment gives us a clue as to when, um, when this book was written. Uh, judges must have been put together after Jerusalem had become an Israeli city. Uh, and so at this point, we're early on in the, in the period of the judges before that has happened, um, before the time of Saul. And David is really the one who conquered Jerusalem. So the author of Judges is probably writing during the reign of David or, or after. Uh, Gibeah and Ramah were Israelite towns. And you know how much I love maps. So here we go. Um, and if you can see my mouse on the screen, um, uh, the hill country of Ephraim is, you can see Ephraim here, so it's kind of up in here. And then, so he traveled down to Bethlehem. That's where his concubine wife was from. Uh, they passed Jabus or Jerusalem, didn't want to stay there. Uh, and so they, they spent the night in Gibeah. It was kind of chosen for them because it became dark, okay? Now, when he says we're going to the house of the Lord, um, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I don't have the map coming up later. Here's Shiloh. Do you see everybody see that there where my mouse is? That is where the tabernacle was. You got to remember, this is before the temple in Jerusalem. Jerusalem hasn't been conquered yet. And so the tabernacle was up here in Shiloh. And, and that's where the Levite says he's going. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay. Hospitality was a highly valued trait and practice and still is among the Bedouin culture of, of uh, the Palestine, Palestine area, the, the Middle East. So I want you to turn to a verse you may never have looked at uh, before in this light. Uh, let's take a look at Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 and 50. And before we read it, I'll ask you a question. Go ahead and answer out loud if you think you know. Uh, this verse in Ezekiel is going to condemn the people of Sodom and Gomorrah why do you think it, they will condemn it? What sin? Sexual sin. That's right. Yeah. Sexual sin, right? So that's mentioned, but uh, would somebody read verses 49 and 50 of Ezekiel 16? Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and de detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them as you have seen. All right. So, so um, in other translations, talk may actually use the, the, the language of they were not hospitable. They did not extend hospitality. And so, if you remember in Genesis 19, if we have time tonight when we get done, we've got about, looks like about 27 minutes to go. Um, we'll actually go to Genesis 19 and, and read through it just to, to really reinforce those similarities. But if you recall, when, when the two angels, the visitors from God, go to Sodom, they go to the, the city plaza. I mean, the, the Mexican word, like, is a plaza. It's the, the town center. And the idea was you would go there and you would wait for someone to say, hey, stay at our house tonight. Now, that's really hard for many of us Americans to think about that way because we just, like, we don't do that. 
if you don't have a place to stay, man, you should have made reservations. You're foolish. <laughs> but in that culture where you didn't have, you know, Best Western and, um, you know, what are the, all the other places, the Ramada and all these places, um, you would go and travel. And if you didn't have a tent to camp with, you would go into the town and someone would take you in for the night. And it was expected that you would do that. That's just how things were. And, and so to not extend hospitality was considered just a really reprehensible thing. And so Sodom is condemned for that along with, as it says in verse 50, then these detestable things, of course, the sexual sins that were mentioned. And so we see the same problem happening back now. We go to Judges chapter 19, where the Levite, his servant, his concubine wife, they show up and they go to the city center and they're ignored. Nobody does anything. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, that the old man who welcomes the travelers into his home is not a resident of Gibeah. In fact, he's from the same area. He's from the area of Mount Ephraim, or some translations say the hill country of Ephraim, as the Levite. And, and so he's not a, a resident of Gibeah. He's not from there. He's there to work. Now, why an old guy is going down there to work in the field, I don't know. Uh, but the text makes it plain that he's not a resident of Gibeah. Now, in verse 18, uh, it, is, it was pretty interesting reading uh, some of the commentary on this. The Levite says, I'm going to the house of God, or the house of the Lord, house of Yahweh. He's never mentioned that before. Uh, and, and In fact, um, he, we're simply told that he's going to go to get her and persuade her to return in verse 3. Uh, and so, but here in verse um, oh, what verse is that? Verse 18, he says he's going to the house of Yahweh, to Shiloh. Well, some, uh, some um, interpreters say it was, this is obviously um, uh, an error in the text. I don't think so. I think he lied. It fits with his character. I think he lied, and he's trying to impress people, and so they'll take good care of him as he goes. That's what I thought. And another thing he does, he says, hey, we've got the food that we need for the people and the animals. We don't need anything from you. And again, he's trying to kind of ingratiate himself, get someone to take him in. I'm going to the house of Yahweh. This is important work I'm doing here. And I've got everything. All you need is to give me a place to sleep. He's trying to find a place to sleep. Now, um, the last words of the old man in verse 20 are very ominous, aren't they? Sure, stay with me, only don't spend the night in the town square. And it appears he knows what kind of a, a town Gibeah is. I wonder if the uh, Levite kind of sensed that, and maybe that's why he threw that out uh, on going to the house of the Lord. Yeah, to try to ward off some of the evil that was about to befall them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Wayne. It makes a lot of sense. You know, you go places and you have a sense of, oh, this is not good. Yep. Yeah. Like going to the, the San Francisco or I'm kidding. Yeah. Well, it can be going to San Francisco. You know, it, it can make you uncomfortable to be around someone who is uh, flirting with you sexually uh, from same sex. That's an uncomfortable feeling. Um, but it's other places too. If If you go into a a city where there's a lot of people walking around late at night and you're in an area where there's a lot of crime that can make you feel very uncomfortable. And it's very possible that the man, um, the man had some inkling that things are not good here. Now in verse 21 here, as we, uh, as we uh, end this section, uh, it appears when it says they sat down to eat and drink or had something to eat and drink, it appears to refer to the old man and the Levite. And so the Levite, with the concubine's father, his father-in-law. They spend time together, nobody else. Here, the Levite again, he's very much the privileged man and the servant and the concubine. You, you go find something to eat, but I'm going to eat here with, with the man. Okay, now, why, now we're going to... Yeah, why go ahead. did the old man say, peace be with you? Yeah, he said shalom. That's literally what it says there, shalom. Why, why is that put in there, you suppose? 
Well, uh, shalom was kind of a greeting. Most of um, that. Uh, it was used in regular conversation. So um, if you go to Israel today, someone might say, if you're with a, a tour group, shalom alechem, it means peace to y'all, or shalom alecha, peace to you, singular. Um, if you've been around uh, Muslims, which uh, my wife and I have, they will say it in Arabic, but you can hear it. It's, it's salam. Oh, and I'll get the pronunciation wrong. But it's basically the same thing. I know enough Hebrew. When I hear, when I hear it in Arabic, I go, yeah, they're saying the same thing. They're saying peace. So it was a greeting. Okay, okay. And we live in a secular culture as Christians. And so in the secular culture, you say, good morning. You say, hello. But in a, in a non-secular culture, which um, most of the world's cultures have always been, we, we're, we live in a different kind of culture, a, kind of a unique experiment, um, they'll give you a greeting of blessing of some sort. And by the way, that's why when I greet the congregation on Sunday mornings, I will say, the Lord be with you, or I will say, Christ is risen. I do that intentionally. Right. It's a habit I try to cultivate because... Anybody in America today can say good morning to you. And there's nothing wrong with that. But only a brother or sister in Christ can say to you, the Lord be with you, or Christ is risen. And so we have greetings that are very powerful and, and very uh, good. And I think it's good for us to use those. Yeah. Okay, verses 22 through 26. Uh, we're up to that now. Uh, someone care to read that or it's kind of bad so i can read it if you don't want to uh, i can read it all right wayne go ahead as they were making their way i'm sorry as they were making hearts merry behold the men of the city worthless fellows surrounded the house beating on the door and they said to the old man the master of the house bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him and the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said, said to them, No, my brothers, do not act so wickedly, since this man has come into my house. Do not do this vile thing. Behold, there are, there are my virgin daughter and, this, and his concubine. Let me bring them out now. Violate them and do with them that seems good to you. But against this man, do not do this outrageous thing bit more. But the men would not listen to him. So the man seizes, seized his concubine and made her go out to them. And they knew her and abused her all night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. And as the morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. All right. Thank you. So two very different scenes are presented in verse 22. The first one is, uh, and I like that your translation, Wayne, said they made their hearts merry. There's that word again, the heart. Uh, and, and so they were eating and drinking and having a good time. And then, we, of course, we get the other scene where instantly we discover, wait a minute, and, and there's a Hebrew word that's translated, behold, whoa, the house is surrounded. Let's take a look at Genesis 19, verse 4. In fact, let's let's do verses three and three and four in Genesis nineteen. Right, this is Lot. He insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. In verse five, they called to Lot, "Where are the men who came to you tonight?" Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. So the parallels are one to one, right? There's a meal. Um, the the house is surrounded, and the demand for uh, homosexual sex is made. Now, the description of the men of Gibeah is also used in the Old Testament to describe liars, wicked, treasonous, and foolish people. Um, some people think it even has uh, a demonic. A connection 
but it's a word that's used pretty rarely and it's hard for us to know for sure, but it probably has the idea of worthless. And, and you see that in our translations today. Why, why would the owner of the, of the house send his virgin daughter out there? Yeah, exactly. Let, we'll get there in just a minute. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's so horrifying, you just shake your head. So the men of Gibeah wanted to rape and humiliate the stranger. The, the term, and again, I like Wayne's translation, that, that we may know him. That is the Hebrew verb that's used to describe sexual intercourse. And so when you're intimate with somebody, you know them, right? You know their body, you know their deepest emotions, you know, in a way nobody else does. And so the, the men of Gibeah wanted to caricature that relationship. And what happens when you know somebody, you become vulnerable, right? You share your secrets, you share your body. And they wanted to force this upon this man to rape and humiliate him. One of the commentators uh, that I had talked about how this wasn't so much about sex, but it was about humiliation and power. And we've heard that, haven't we, in our culture today, that rape is not straight up a sexual sin, although it certainly includes that, but it's also a, a great deal about power and control. So just a little break here. Which city seems more pagan now? Jabus? <laughs> that they didn't want to go to or Gibeah, right? I mean, it's wow. And we'll talk more about that <laughs> later. So this is what Maureen was getting at here. The master of the house uh, pleads with, that's what it should say. I don't know why it says please. In fact, let me, uh, I can fix that right now. Okay, we'll get back to that. Okay, so the master of the house pleads with the men to not act in a wicked fashion. So what they want to do is clearly wicked. But then he offers up two women for the men. His own daughter, described as a virgin, and the concubine. And remember, he's out there by himself. He's speaking for the man inside the house. And, and so even though this guy is a, a man of Ephraim, he's not from Gibeah, he's not innocent in any stretch or fashion. And again, let's go back to Genesis 19, verse 8. Um, I've got it, so I'll just read it for you. So this is, again, back in Sodom, and, Sodom and, and the men demand that the two strangers be be brought out. And Lot says, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do with what you like with them, but don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. <laughs> So, ladies, be glad you live in the United States in the year 2021. Do you suffer sexually in our culture? Absolutely, you do. But it could be a whole lot worse. Mm -hmm. So why he did that, Maureen? I think he's simply saying it's the lesser of two evils. And women were seen um, in a much lower uh, way. Uh -huh. back in that day than, than they are today. Can you clarify one thing for me, please? Yeah. Uh, it try. says that uh, the man took his concubine and sent her outside. Yes. Is that the concubine of the visitor or the man who owns the house? It's the, it, and I, I, I might even have someone in your study guide for this, but I, um, it, it is ambiguous. It could be translated either way, but in all likelihood, um, it, it's, uh, when he's speaking in verse 24, is that what you're saying? Look, here's my virgin daughter and, and his concubine. That's the man, the, the owner of the house talking. Yes. But, because later he takes, takes her home and well, I won't go into the good details, but yeah, but, but later then, well, let, let me just get to it. Let's just go in order. So verse 24, don't miss this. Um, I think our translations say things like, uh, you can do to them whatever you wish, but guess what it says literally in Hebrew? Uh, do to them, to these 
these women, do to them the good thing in your eyes. And, and that phrase in the book of Judges is so important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. They did whatever mm -hmm. that was right in their own eyes, or what they had done was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, okay. And so it's just, you know, that's just, it's a big billboard. We have to see that. Yes. Uh, verse 24 of Judges 19 and Genesis 34 too. We read that earlier. That's where Shechem rapes Dinah. It's the same verb that's used here. Now in verse 25, where it says the man, the men would not listen to him. So the man took his concubine and sent her outside to them. Again, that's a little ambiguous, John, but that's probably the Levite. In other words, the Levite standing behind the door takes the concubine and shoves her out the door. Now, is it possible that it was the older man who uh, either owned or was living in the house? It's possible, but it, but the, the way it's written makes it sound like it's probably the Levite who takes his concubine wife and shoves her out there. Yeah, and that kind of makes sense to me in a, in a way because uh, apparently... I don't know what his reasoning is by any means, but uh, he he doesn't value her that much. So in the whole chapter, he doesn't value her. Away. That's right. And one of the commentators point out, and that's why I have the word man in quotations there, that he has been referred to by that word, the man, several times in the chapter. But but the old man, um, the father-in-law, that they, they they are almost always giving descriptions. That it's not just a man, but it's an old man. It's it's the father-in-law. We don't have that here. So that's why the commentator believes it's probably the Levite who sticks his concubine wife out outside the door. Uh, thank you. So he forces the concubine to go outside. It's, it's a very forcible word. Uh, my NIV says, sent her outside. That That's an okay translation. But what you want to remember is that he's doing this. And he's treating her like property, just like you would put the dog outside if it had to go to the bathroom or his donkeys, he just sends her out. She has no say in the matter. You, now I'm sure she spoke, but in the whole chapter, she never says anything. Her words are not recorded and that's intentional. It, it, it's trying to show how bad things have become in Israel, that the people who had the word of God in Genesis, where it says uh, that the woman is a helper suitable corresponding to him, and that the two shall become one flesh, that she is made in the image of God, these people are treating women like this. So the virgin daughter didn't get thrown outside. No, she didn't. No, no she didn't. And boy, lucky for her, right? Yeah. Or maybe not luck, but, but just favorable for her. Three verbs describe what the men of Gibeah did to the concubine. They knew her. I talked about that before. That's the word for sexual intercourse. They abused her. That's that word for rape. And then they discarded her. And again, it's literally they sent her. Um, it's the same verb that was used before when she was sent out the door. Now they send her back to the house. Um, uh, the text here says they let her go. But, but sending, it's like send her off. They discarded her. Yeah. They treat her in an inhuman way, even as the Levite did. She's just, they use her as a weapon to get at the man. They want to humiliate him. And so if they can't have the man, they'll have his concubine wife and they'll abuse her all night long. I mean, just what a, what a horrific night that must have been for her. I, I can't even imagine. Now notice here that the man is called her master or Lord. Um, and it's, it's the way that the, the servant boy speaks to him and about him. He was the boy's master, and here she's described as, or he's described as her master, right there in verse 26. And not by accident, right? He was supposedly her husband, but now he's just her master, her boss. Now, as if things couldn't get any worse, they do. <laughs> So verses 27 to 30, 
When her master got up in the morning and opened the door of the house and stepped out to continue on his way, there lay his concubine, fallen in the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, get up, let's go. But there was no answer. Then the man put her on his donkey and set out for home. When he reached home, he took a knife and cut up his concubine limb by limb into 12 parts and sent them into all the areas of Israel. Everyone who saw it said, such a thing has never been seen or done, not since the day the Israelites came up out of Egypt. Think about it. Consider it. Tell us what to do. So verses 27 and 28 continue to reveal the callous attitude of the man toward his concubine. Um, I mean, do I even need to say anything? No. I mean, it's so, it's so obvious. And what's horrible to this, while she came to the door for help, he slept. Did you notice the detail? Her hands were on the threshold. She's like falling down on the threshold, crawling, wanting to be rescued. And he slept. The vocabulary of verse 29 is usually used for the cutting up of animals. The way you see it in in the Hebrew language in the Old Testament. Uh, We're also never explicitly told when the woman died. Was she dead on the threshold? I hope so. But we don't know. Did he kill her when he cut her up? I mean, it's, it's a possibility. We don't know. And that's why I say we've got a monster here. Maureen. Is there supposed to be some meaning regarding why he did that and send it and sent her limb by limb into 12 part, well, into all the areas of Israel? I mean, was there some reason that he would do that? Oh, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, he wants revenge. I mean, and I don't mean to try and make this funny. Uh, but but I think he needed a new pair of underwear on the night when the house was surrounded. He was terrified for being sexually raped by a whole bunch of men and probably killed. He had to be terrified. He escaped by the skin of his teeth. Notice he got up early in the morning. Mm-hmm. He wanted to get out of town before anybody else was awake so they couldn't come after him. Yeah. And so I, I think he's terrified. He's angry. He's kind of out of his mind a little bit. I mean, if you guys have seen the movie, The Shawshank Redemption, uh, yeah. I, yeah. It, it's a well-done movie, but man, I mean, I sat there watching that movie and it gave me the creeps because the man is raped in prison and it's terrifying. It's terrifying to me as a man. And, and, and so he experienced that fear. And I think, I think he is saying something's got to be done. And so why 12? Because there's 12 tribes in Israel. Every tribal headquarters is going to get a package from UPS. Yeah. Uh, and, and somebody, I don't know, and he paid people to deliver this, I'm sure. Um, they, they would bring the parts of this woman with some explanation of where, and where this happened and what happened and all this. And so he's, uh, that's why he does that. Well, what kind of a man cuts up a woman in 12 pieces? What kind of a man shoves her out the door when there's a rape gang outside? I mean, this guy's a monster. He's he's sick in the head. You might say he's possessed. Yeah, he might have been. We don't know. It's kind of odd to think that, I mean, if he's sending those parts out to make a commentary on how horrible these people were in the city yet he's pretty horrible himself oh, absolutely so i you know to me that's confusing I, mean, I guess you know we all that happens you know people will point fingers at someone else saying that their crime or behavior is worse than their own it just it's well, yeah think of what happens in wartime uh i i i enjoy reading about World War II and other wars too, but I have a book. It talks about how there was a group of Americans um, 
moving into Germany and uh, they found a whole bunch of dead Americans. And the evidence was very clear that they had been shot as prisoners. And there was a bunch of them. I want to say like, uh, might even been over a hundred. And so these Americans go on and they, they captured a bunch of German prisoners. Now, the rules were very clear. Captured prisoners were sent behind your lines and they were processed and dealt with. These Americans shot and killed every German, every last one of them, because they were so incensed over what had been done. And, and these were ordinary people. These were Americans that grew up working on the farm. Not what you would expect. But when that kind of violence had been seen done to some of their boys, they retaliated in kind. And so this Levite, um, he has seen terrible things done. And he does terrible things himself. And the other reason, I think, Beth, is that the author of Judges is just showing how the whole, the whole nation is going down the toilet. Uh, and that's this last little statement here. Israel was behaving worse than the pagan nations she had been sent to expel. They didn't even do stuff like this. And look what Israel was doing. What I was surprised at was he's a Levite who is from the priestly tribe. Yes. God chose the, pre you know, the Levites to be the priestly tribe. And then, you yep. know, they do something like that. Yep. Um, and let me just remind you when the, the next book, in, in kind of order is first Samuel and second Samuel. And you read about the priest Eli, he's a good guy, but he's, his, his sons are terrible. And, and he's kind of old and semi-retired. They're the ones who are now working at the tabernacle. And, and for the food, um, they had a custom that, that they had a servant who would just, when a family brought an animal um, to sacrifice, uh, often they would boil the meat and, and then they would, sacrifice it or eat it depending on what you did with it and and the sons of levi said no 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 we don't want boiled meat we want it roasted don't they wanted it grilled i i get it but they the, the servant would try to be following the the pious custom of the tabernacle and they said no give us the meat before it's boiled we don't want boiled meat and worse than that there were women who were there who were were helping out uh at the tabernacle i mean the closest thing i could think of would be like altar guild oh they regularly slept with them and these guys were priests, not just Levites, but priests. So um, that shocks us. But this is why I'm so glad the Bible is so honest, because yeah. it just shows us the tremendous power of sin and how dark sin can be. And we're living in it right now, right? And, and what, are, what are a lot of us Christians feeling right now? We're feeling shock. How can people behave this way? Well, this is what people do. Why are we surprised? The Bible shows us story after story after story after story, generation after generation after generation. People are horrible sinners. We've forgotten that. And, and I, I, Pastor Kyle, I had a lengthy conversation yesterday. You, you'll get some of it maybe in the video next week. We're, we're going to start this video podcast thing I'm, I was telling you about. But anyways, what happens is we start believing the lie kind of subconsciously that people are basically good. Yeah. And then we're shocked. How could someone do that? I can tell you why. They're a depraved sinner who's turned away from God. That's why. And that's why my heart, even though I've been saved and I rejoice that Jesus leads me to behave well, my heart is still black with sin at times. That's reality. And this should make us cling to God's word and to his grace. I mean, if we really believe this, would there ever be a day we didn't open our Bibles? But because we don't really need it, because we're all basically pretty good. We don't, I can skip a day or two or a week or a month. It's no big deal. You see how ridiculous that is? Am I making it sound ridiculous? I'm trying really hard. <laughs> right. Now, some, conclu some concluding thoughts. By referring to Genesis 19 and Sodom, you know, bringing them together, what is the author of Judges hoping to get his readers to understand? The two stories are so parallel. You can't miss it. Why? That the sinfulness of the people then in Sodom's time are just the same as they are 
for him in his time. Yeah. And so as Israel, are, Israel is no better than? Take the world. Yeah, or specifically, Israel is no better than Sodom. Right. Yeah. That's a hard thing to swallow, isn't it? Oh my yes. goodness, we're we're not like those people. <laughs> and you know, I, I think the parallel to church uh, is very obvious. How have ungodly practices crept into the church today? Well, I th I think some churches cave in to what the world wants, and so they are willing to compromise on God's word to uh, please the people and give them what they want. And or that might please, be... Or even please themselves. And this is yeah. going to be recorded and posted on YouTube. So I want to make sure that people understand that we hold, we hold clearly to the teachings of the Bible, but that doesn't mean we hate people who sin sexually or, or whatever. You know, no. God's mercy no. and grace is for all of us. And our, our goal and our calling is to treat people with love and dignity, no matter where they come from and no matter what sexual orientation they might have. But that doesn't mean we're going to compromise. And, and what you see happening in the church today, and, and by that I mean the church at large, there are a number of church bodies that have accepted every kind of sexual behavior as okay. Um, and, and that's a problem. It's not good for humanity. Humanity is not going to flourish with that model. So how does Jesus identify with the concubine and all those who have suffered abuse? There's forgiveness for... But how does he how does he identify with them? Suffered, really, just had suffered. Yeah. What happened to Jesus when he was arrested? He was beaten and spit on and flogged. Yeah, beaten. Humiliated. Killed. Humiliated. Yep. So he was dehumanized. That's right. That's a great way to say that, John. It's a great word to bring back to the end of our study tonight, and. Uh, when Jesus was on the cross, in all likelihood, he was buck naked because the whole idea was to bring humiliation upon the person who was uh, condemned by Rome. And that sign above the cross, um, this is the king of the Jews. I mean, think about how humiliating that would be. Here's your king. He's naked, dying on a cross, and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, that's, that's humiliation. Uh, and so Jesus does not simply identify by saying, oh, there, there, I know it's tough. He's been through horrible humiliation, horrible dehumanization. His body was just brought nearly to death by flogging, and then he was hung on a cross. And then, yes, he bore the sin of gang rapists on the cross. He was punished for gang rape on the cross. Think about that. That's amazing. And so there's, there's hope for all people who have suffered abuse in the Savior, who understands it, who has experienced it, and who died for it, so that those who have suffered have this hope, that there is, there is healing in Jesus. There is life, that our bodies will be remade and purified in eternity and never to be abused or violated again. That's really, really powerful. Now, one thing I didn't think of until tonight during the study, I'd like you all to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. I wish I would have put this on your study guide, so you might just write the reference down uh, on your study guide for later reference. What chapter? 5. I don't want to start at verse 25. I'm going to read it here. Ephesians 5.25. I'll give you a few more seconds. I see some of you are still looking it up. Hmm. Okay, Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Think what Jesus did. You know, that idea of gave himself up for her, I think it's easy to sort of sanitize it and make it pious religious language, but... But think of it this way, when, when the house was surrounded, in the sense of humanity is surrounded by the enemies of sin and Satan and death, 
Let them out. We want to destroy them. Jesus went outside, shut the door behind him, and took the punishment we deserve. That almost brings tears to my eyes. To, to think what Jesus did for us. And then, to, he did that to make her holy. That means to set her apart. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. That's baptism. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So every sexual sin we have committed has been paid for. And in our baptism, we have been washed clean of that. And Jesus presents us to himself as a, as a radiant church, a wonderful wife, not treating us like property, not ignoring us, not putting us in harm's way. Jesus presents himself, presents us to himself without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. My and that goodness. brings us joy. Yes. My goodness, you are loved. You are loved more than, we are loved more than we can even know. It's amazing. So as we close tonight, any comments or thoughts or questions before I pray? That was an awfully hard chapter to read. It is. And so I want to encourage you to, to read Ephesians, Ephesians 5.25 before you go to sleep tonight. That's our hope and redemption. We, we need to hear Judges 19. It's in the Bible because God wants us to see how powerfully destructive sin is. And, and we're the problem. But we need to read Ephesians 5 and maybe read one of the gospel accounts of the death and resurrection of Jesus tonight to be reminded that he is the solution. And he gave himself up for us. I watched the uh, documentary about uh, Bonhoeffer on Amazon Prime. Oh. And we were talking about, you know, when he was executed, he was marched out um, and stripped naked. And, you know, his, his spirit could not, his spirit would not allow the Nazis to demean him. I mean, obviously they took his life. They tried to humiliate him, but you know, he had the spirit of Christ in him, giving him strength to the last minute. And it also reminded me of Corey Ten Boom, who was stripped naked in the concentration camp. And, you know, she said, now I know how it feels to suffer like Jesus, you know. Well, that's, that was Betsy. And in fact, I just oh, talked about that today. So Betsy and Corey are in the prison camp, a Nazi concentration camp, a death camp. The guards strip them and make them go around in a circle, humiliating them. And Corey writes that Betsy turned around and she had a smile on her face. And Corey's like, are you nuts? You know, what's going on? And she said, to think that he was naked too. Mm-hmm. And, and also, Corey was filled with peace and joy, and even in that terrible moment. And so, my friends, even in these terrible things that can happen in this life, to have a Savior who suffered so dreadfully out of love for us and who cleanses us of our sins and presents us to himself as blameless, boy, there's, there's great healing there. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we can never begin to thank you enough. Tonight we pray for all the victims of, of sexual abuse in our world. Uh, it's a pretty common thing because we have twisted and marred every bit of your creation, including sexuality. And there are wounded people all around us. Lord, we pray that, that you would help us to be like Von Hafer was, an agent of grace. That you would help us to be people who speak with compassion and kindness and healing because of Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us that we might be cleansed. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.